Hey everyone, welcome, come on in. Um, if you are joining us for the first time and this is just something we do every week, please let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat function. We always love to see where everyone is in the world and around Australia. Um, we have a lot to get through today, so we're going to dive straight in. Um, I'm Danny from the community team at Blackbird. Um, and today we are covering OKRs or objectives and key results. So it's a goal setting tool used by teams to achieve their big audacious goals. Um, and Google, Spotify, Twitter, LinkedIn, Airbnb and Blackbird all use OKRs. So you can bet that um, they're very much worth giving a go if you haven't already. And we couldn't really think of a better person to take you through the magic of this goal setting tool than Ryan Panchathram. So Ryan is the co-founder of What Matters. He's an advisor to the chairman at venture firm Kleiner Perkins. And he was formerly the US Deputy Chief Technology Officer at the White House. So today, Ryan is gonna share the do's and don'ts of OKRs. Um, and he's gonna kind of dive straight in. So he's gonna assume that you know what OKRs are, and we're gonna get straight into the meat of it today. Um, please post your questions. We'll have around 10, 15 minutes at the end. Please post your questions into the Q&A function and I'll make sure we try and get through them for you. Um, but yeah, don't use the chat, try and use that Q&A. So I'm gonna hand it straight over to Ryan now. And yeah, good luck, enjoy everyone. Awesome, it's so good to be here. Hello everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan Pachatsaram. It's, uh, it's really good to be here. I'm a friend of Nick Crocker's at uh, Blackbird and uh, the two of us are building digital health companies together back in 2011. And uh, I'm here to tell you more and talk to you more about OKRs. And I think there's one thing that holds true is a lot of us know a lot about OKRs already. And so my hope in this time that we spend together is to kind of unpack a few of the key lessons and things we've learned along the way. And maybe just a quick uh, uh, ask in the chat is, you know, if you've never heard of OKRs before, put a zero and hit enter. If you have heard of OKRs before and use them actively, press one into the chat as well too. And then the kind of, uh, oh, perfect, there we go. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And for the folks that are putting the ones in, uh, if you've seen them used well, uh, maybe put a two. And if you've seen them used poorly, put a three. And if you've seen both, put two comma three, just to see, okay, good, good. Uh, this is, okay, awesome, awesome. <laughs> and so the thing about this goal setting system is that it is so simple, right? It is objectives and key results, and we'll unpack that, but it's really meant to be a vocabulary and a tool for you to use to articulate what you want your team to accomplish together. And so my day job is working at Kleiner Perkins for the chairman, John Doerr, and together we invest in disruptive companies that change how we live, change the way that our healthcare system is in the United States, and also ones really right now, more importantly, on the climate crisis. But um, I'm here to tell you more about John and OKRs and how to use them. And John's the original Johnny Appleseed of this system. He learned them. Uh, by uh, from Andy Grove at Intel, and he taught them to Google and other places. And I've been fortunate to learn from him, but also through using them myself and also spending time with other leaders who try to use this system. And together, both John and I launched whatmatters.com to really be that resource for more content, uh, for more stories of different kinds of companies and places, and then more educational materials as well, too. And um, if we can in the chat, just to get a quick question on what our motivations are. And you know, for, for folks that are attending, what do you hope to get out of OKRs? What are they not doing for you? What do you want to get more from them? And as you drop them in, I will make sure to weave perfect alignment and efficiency from Varia. What else, why? Why a simple way to align company and team goals want to get a sense of what I've been doing with OKRs. Perfect, we've been using them for two quarters and want to be able to use them even better. Clarity and cut through, this is fantastic. When we ask this question, we really hear a lot of this desire for focus, right? And aligning our teams and getting commitment together because getting commitment is hard, whether you're even two people or 2000. Also, the system gives you a superpower of being able to track and putting everything out in the open. And when used really well, it should help you to stretch. And I'll tell you more about that in a sec as well, too. So the quick primer on objectives and key results. Objectives are the what you and your team want to accomplish. 
And a really good objective is articulating your goal, right? It can be significant, it should be concrete, action-oriented and inspirational are pluses as well too. And so that's the objective. You pair your objectives with a set of key results. The key results are the how you're gonna accomplish it, right? It's the milestones and markers that say you're making progress towards the goal that you set. And a really good set of KRs or key results are that they're specific and time bound, right? There's a deadline. There's a precise way of articulating what you're trying to accomplish. They're aggressive, but realistic. And you are the judge of if they're aggressive enough or not, your team is. And most of all, they're measurable and verifiable. When you look at each key result that you write down, you've got to make sure that you're actually able to track them. And if you complete them all, it means you've achieved your objective. And so that's what's powerful about the system. And so I wanted to put on the screen just a few examples of OKRs. The first one is from John and when he worked at Intel. And you can read more about this in the book uh, about the Operation Crush, getting the Intel microchip processor to be one of the leading uh, chips. The middle one is actually from my experience. I worked on this turnaround crisis team on this website in the U.S. that we had called healthcare.gov. And in there, we had a very clear objective, and that was to fix this website for the vast majority of consumers. And uh, as measured by, and these were the key results that we picked, right? Seven out of 10 people being able to apply, less than a second response time, a low error rate, and 99% uptime. On the surface, these things might actually not seem so hard for you and your teammates, but when we got to the scene uh, of, of this crisis, um, barely uh, six people out of 100,000 could get through the system. So that first goal was pretty aspirational. The response time was in the 12 to 20 second range. The error rate was in the 10 percent, and the uptime, if I'm remembering correctly, was 48 percent, which means the website was down for half the day uh, versus it being up the 99.99s that we're all used to. But these are examples of what OKRs look like. We've all seen them together. What I did want to share was a few of our learnings, and this comes from the collective we at whatmatters.com. We've had the privilege of spending time with leaders of for-profits, right, companies and startups, uh, nonprofits, as well as governments. And uh, we've had time with large teams, 3,000 plus or two to three, right? The true startup itself. And I wanted to share with this community five pieces of advice that I hope make you and your team more successful in using OKRs, but also successful as well too, because if the system is used well, it should be moving your team towards the goals that you're setting. And so the first piece of advice we find ourselves reminding is that you use OKRs to lead and you use KPIs and all of the other tools you have at your disposal to manage, right? You lead with OKRs and you manage with KPIs. John likes to say that OKRs should never be the sum of all tasks. And that's really important, right? When you craft the OKRs for your company, for your team, the question you wanna ask yourself is what are we trying to do different in the days ahead? The quarter ahead, the year ahead, what are we trying to change? You know, you don't want your OKRs to be a list of what's business as usual, because if it's business as usual, shift it over into the KPI or other tracking kind of systems that you use. Your OKR should be the two to three things that are really important. And that's what makes them powerful is that you find yourself every time that you go into a meeting, you start with your OKRs and then you jump to the other lists and other things you use to track. There's a great story we have on the website with uh, Joey from Allbirds, and he talks about their OKRs as well as another list ca called their breathe list. They, they call their OKRs actually Kiwis, keep improving with intent. And so they make them their own. There's another story on our site from the team at TED who calls their OKRs OMGs. Uh, objectives and measurable goals. And so both companies and organizations try to make them a bit their own. And so the Kiwis are all birds' OKRs. And then they have this breathe list that captures all the other things that they need to do to make sure that the lights are on and that shoes are being made and that they're going after and, and actually doing really good work. And so having these two, I think, really grounds what this tool is meant for. So that's the first piece. The second piece is being clear about how you define success. Um, you know, if you're familiar with the Google 
uh, sense of OKRs, there's a committed OKR and an aspirational OKR. As we've spent more time with teams, especially startups, as well as teams that are in more kind of R&D groups, we actually find ourselves having three types of OKRs, right? There's the committed goals that we have where the finish line, it's expected that we cross it. This could be anything from a sales goal that we might have as a team or a uptime target or honestly anything that we commit to together that says we will halt everything and anything to make sure that this gets done. 100% is what we're trying to achieve. An aspirational goal, so the middle bucket is the OKRs that push us to do the audacious, right? These are the higher risk and harder to achieve goals and your team is gonna stretch to meet these key results. We like to say that you know, on average, you find yourself achieving these 70% of a time, right? But that, that means that, you know, sometimes you knock it out of the park and sometimes you're going to fall short. And then on average, when you look across this, this, this type of OKR that you're setting, you're really ending up at that 70 to 80% mark. And so that's an aspirational goal, right? Committed are the things we have to and must get done. Aspirational is where you're pushing and stretching your team which then puts us to the third type of goal, which is a learning goal, right? If the first two are trying to answer the question of what are we trying to accomplish in the quarter ahead? This last one is what are we trying to learn in the quarter ahead, right? What are we trying to learn in this period of time? And that's in a really important frame because you know one of the critiques we've heard about OKRs is sometimes they're too directional, right? You use them and they might send you off on a path that you're not ready to take yet. And so, changing the frame a little bit to this being a learning goal. You know, what is the hypothesis we're trying to set is a really powerful way to, you know, use this in the startup environment, right? What are we trying to learn in the next two weeks? What do we need to prove is working right? Sometimes makes this system more um, useful in the kind of environment that we have. The next piece of advice is you are the judge of a great OKR. And when I say you, I mean you and your team. Right. Um, you know, there are different types of key results. So, right, an objective will have three to five key results or sometimes five to seven key results. It's really up to you to choose the right amount that are there. And these key results can be made up of a few things. And they usually fall into these three categories, inputs, outputs, and outcomes. Inputs are the things you control, right? These are the specific actions and activities that you're trying to do to reach your objective, right? These are the number of stores opened or if you're relaunching your company website or maybe reducing a weight of a component if you're trying to build something. You know, Amazon and Jeff Bezos, he's a very big proponent of managing by focusing on inputs because that's what you control as a team not the output side. And so that's one uh, theory of thought. The uh, second type of key result are outputs. And outputs are the result of the things you do. And the father of OKRs, right, Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel, viewed outputs as the measuring stick of OKRs because you either reached them or you didn't, right? And his point was if you stress an output, you're going to find that's going to be the thing that's going to increase productivity. And some examples of output type KRs are increasing sales revenue or reaching a certain performance benchmark of a product or maybe number of attendees to a conference if you're holding an event. And there then comes the third category of OKRs, outcomes, right? Outcomes are what has changed. And quite often these measures connect with why you're pursuing this objective, right? The goal that you've set. And these are often harder to measure, right? An example of an outcome KR it could be the net promoter score, right? Or, you know, if it's a healthcare procedure, the number of people that are able to walk after it, right? If it's something like, like what's the true thing you're trying to drive for on this objective? You know, it might be something like the renewal rate. And so with these three types of KRs, it's up to you and your teams to craft the right set that attach to your objective and together you have this well-defined unit and a few things we'd love to add as well too is you know an outcome orientation usually creates a really powerful OKR but we understand the power of these other KRs as well and so you might find yourself with the KR sorry with an OKR that has you know two or outcome measures one is an input and two might be an output 
And it's up to you to pick. And there's no right answer. Because remember, OKRs are this communication tool for you to use with your team, right? And because it's a communication tool, you know, this is the thing that it's really up to you to set. The uh, fourth bit of advice is to match the pace of the OKR cadence to the pace of your work. What we have found uh, as time has gone on is that, you know, for a lot of you that have companies that can't wait a quarter, that maybe you need to be doing the OKR cycle monthly, right? Or even faster than that, right? This cadence that you pick is really up to you and should match the moment. And the flip has happened as well too. We've spent time with companies where quarters really didn't line up and it was actually a trimester, which ended up working really well. And then the complete flip is we've spent time with, um, you know, an MLB, a, a baseball team, which uh, for them, they were like, well, what if we break this up into the preseason? We'll take the season and cut it in half and have the first part and second part, and then we'll have the postseason. And we're gonna set goals for each of those different periods of time. And the purpose of cutting the season in half was to make sure that there was enough time to set a set of OKRs, try to execute upon them, and then reflect on them. Because that's the powerful thing, right? OKRs are not meant to be a system for judgment or anything about setting compensation or blame. What it is, is it's a learning tool for you and your team. We set a set of OKRs today, we commit to them, and then when our quarter or month or the cadence that we set passes, we revisit them and we grade them objectively, right? Did we do them? Did we not? And then we reflect on them, right? Why didn't we achieve that goal? What do we be need, need to be do differently? Should we have set this target higher or lower? It's really meant to be a forward looking system, not one that sends you backwards. And the last piece of advice that I'll, that I'll leave you with before we jump to Q&A is that it does take a team to make these successful. You know, for an OKR system to work really well, it needs to have the buy-in and sponsorship from the CEO, the leader of an organization, or a leader of a team, right? If you're gonna try it out and part of an organization. But you know, in this example here, you have that leader who's bought in, the CEO. You have someone who's the operator, right? The COO or a chief of staff or someone else within the organization that's using them more operationally. And then you have a whole group, a community of shepherds, right? These are people and individuals on teams, which it's their job to make sure that their teams are setting, reviewing, and are really pushing this process forward. And so, you know, if you find yourself alone in trying to roll out OKRs, find a set of teammates that are, that can be advocates with you. Because when this works really well, it really does take everyone to, to do it right. And, you know, I like to remind folks that while Google is an amazing exemplar example of OKRs being used, there's a great playbook that we have that comes from, from them on, on the site. You know, they started with OKRs when there were 30 people. And so their organization from 30 to, you know, the 300,000 that it is today has been using them day in, day out. And so that's why they have top level, mid individual OKRs. It's, it's part of their DNA. And for folks here, if you're starting out with them or, you know, OKRs are truly, you know, a new concept, you don't have to start it that way. We really encourage teams to you know, first, just try to draft a top level set of OKRs to guide your company and maybe departments and then figure out how deep you want to go. Um, and, you know, when 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 teams are just two or three people, maybe individual OKRs are a little overkill, right? When teams are just a few people, you know, they're really meant to be this rallying tool for groups of folks. And so when you get large enough, you can start to cascade and do things accordingly. And so just to summarize again, you know, you use OKRs to lead. It's, they're meant to capture what you want to change, what you want to do different, what you want to learn. And you manage your organization using other tools, right? You use these both in particular ways. Be clear about how you define success, where you draw that finish line. Is this a goal that we have to cross, like we have to meet, you know, on the committed side? Or is it more aspirational? And so if we get close to it, we're still successful. Or is it one where we're really learning about something and we're trying to prove a hypothesis? And I always like to remind you and your team are the greatest judge of, judges of what great OKRs are. And you'll get continually better and better each cycle the more time you spend with them. And I'd love to recommend as well too to match the pace of your OKRs to how you work day in, day out so it feels natural. And of course it takes a team as well too. And um, 
with that, Danny, I'm going to switch over to Q&A with you. I haven't been looking awesome. that way, but... Thank you. Yeah. yeah, we have quite a few have rolled in. Um, so we'll start with potentially an, an easier one from uh, Josh Daniel. How do you suggest mapping OKRs to KPIs? Yeah, so I, I like to say that uh, OKRs are KPIs with a bit of soul, right? You know, your KPIs are your measures. They're all really important. That's why they're key performance indicators, right? You've picked them for a reason. But, you know, you can have a lot of KPIs. And the question then becomes is, well, which one of them are you trying to change in the next 90 days, right? That period of time that you're setting for your OKRs. And how do you want to change? Are you trying to increase it? Are you trying to decrease it? What's the thing you want to do about it? And what you then realize is as you start to articulate that directionality, it becomes a key result, right? So you may have a key result, sorry, a KPI. Let's say we're running a campaign, getting folks to vote. And one of our KPIs is just numbers of knocks on doors. And we track a lot of things right on our campaign, but maybe we've heard that really to win, we need to get a lot of knocks on doors, like not just like 20% uh, uh, more, but like double them. And so we together can say, let's make a key result that says, let's take that KPI of knocks on doors and double it in the next 90 days ahead, because we think it's going to help us achieve our objective of winning this election. Awesome. Um, so we have a few that are sort of similar here. What happens if the scope of an OKR or KR changes during the period of, um, yeah. you know, the, the quarter or whatever it is, and what's the best way to adapt and can you do that? Yes, you can. Uh, the, uh, you know, in the little image of uh, matching your pace, you know, that was a little signpost of right around when COVID hit, right? You know, COVID, at least in the United States, became a real big thing in March, April. Teams had already set their OKRs for the year ahead. A lot of them have set their Q2 OKRs. And the reminder is this is a system for us, right? Like our team. And so if the circumstance of the world around us changes, you have to revisit them, right? You have to change them. And that's on the big macro sense. But I think, you know, in the more day-to-day -day sense of, uh, let's say just a week into this quarter, um, something big changes, like a client or a customer or something we observe changes truly our ability to, to meet this objective and key result. Well, this is the opportunity for us to reset and to recalibrate or to decide we're not going to and that we're going to stick to this for at least a quarter. And then when we get to the end of the quarter, we can then revisit. Um, a, a similar question we also get is, can you add a OKR midstream, right? Uh, you know, a month already goes by and let's say a crisis has come about and, and the answer is absolutely, right? OKRs can be this way to articulate what you and the team need to get done. The thing you have to think about though is if you introduce a new OKR midstream, what happens to the others? Are you going to deprioritize them, you know, and so forth? There's a really good part in the book where John goes into how OKRs are a really good tool for people to be able to say no and yes as well too, right? Like, yes, we can do that. Let's agree to the OKRs that we can share or no, I can't because look, isn't this what I'm working on really the important thing for the, you know, X months ahead? Awesome. Um, so we have a question here on when doing your OKR reflections for uh, the quarter or whatever the time period is, what are the guiding questions um, that can prompt really powerful insights? Oh, it's a great question. We have some uh, awesome resources on whatmatters.com that I'll make sure we get and send out. But um, some questions that always come to mind to me uh, usually are around, you know, if we hit an OKR, right? Like, what would we do to change it in the quarter ahead? Or if we didn't hit that OKR, uh, and what does that mean to us as a team, right? Do we need to increase our target, right, to stretch and push the team? Or if we didn't hit it, what happened? Is there, or were there resources that we didn't allocate? Was there a customer or a competitor that did something to change the environment on the ground? Um, in looking at these, this, this, this set too, it lets you sort of also say, well, you know, everything that we've learned in this quarter, how would we recraft our key results for the next quarter? I mean, like the reflection step is so powerful, right? Like you and the team should spend as much time on the reflection side because it'll help you set the KR, you know, the OKRs for the next quarter that you do and even crafting them. And, you know, one technique I love to use in crafting OKRs is just a reminder to share them with people. Because even when I craft my OKRs with like our team or with John, I 
they never do them perfect the first time, right? Like there's something about them that you have to show them to someone and then they see these really obvious things and ways to improve them. Love that. Um, so we have a question here for a 10 person startup of what mm. have you found to be a manageable number of OKRs? Yeah, for, for a 10 person startup, dare I say it, you might be able to fit all of your OKRs just on a sheet of paper, right? Like you could probably fit uh, three objectives with maybe three to five key results each. And that may be enough to encompass the work of the entire team. And then what you may find is as you grow from 10 to 15 or 20 or 30, you may see a department saying, well, you know, we've got other priorities too that sure they ladder up to this top level set of OKRs, but we need to articulate them as well. And you might then see uh, top level OKRs and department level OKRs. And then as you grow, you'll then maybe need team level OKRs. It, it ends up being this natural kind of pressure point. But um, the fun thing is, you know, you can just pull up a, a Google Doc or a spreadsheet with 10 folks and just start jamming immediately on, a, on, on, on your KRs. Cool. We have so many questions. They're all really good. I'm going to try and get through a few more. So this one um, is, do you suggest using a North Star or other directional tools in addition to OKRs yeah. or do you see OKRs as filling that space? When I when I, uh, I see the question from Josh, when I hear that that, mm. that North Star, I, I don't know about the the tool part of it, but like, I do know the like emotional inspirational piece of it, right? Like, what's the North Star of our organization? Why are we here, right? Like that we have to answer first, and then from that we usually can then articulate a goal that we're going to try to accomplish, right? And like for example, let's say we are a group that's trying to, you know, we have a story of actually maybe using a real example. It's a group called Upsolve uh, about helping folks in the United States. You know, they're trying to eliminate, eliminate bankruptcy, right? Like that's their North Star, but their objective for the year ahead is like to get rid of like a hundred million dollars worth of bankruptcies, right? It's like, sure, that's the North Star and this is how, how, how we get there. And so the North Star is a really powerful rallying tool. The objective is forcing you to kind of articulate that rallying cry within a time frame, And what we do find is quite often is as a team, you know, you set a set of OKRs for the year, right? At the top level, right? For the top level organization. Because there's going to be a certain point when you reach more than X number of people where your team is looking to you as the leader, as the CEO and the executive team for consistency. And, you know, they want to see sort of a path for the year ahead. And by the way, you can always change things as the year goes by, but it's like you articulate your direction for the company as this top level OKR. And then you leave it up to your departments to be the ones that are setting the quarterly cadence. And that's usually what we find working quite, quite well. Awesome. Do you have any questions in here that you've seen that you want to answer? Otherwise I'll choose one more before we go. Ooh. Yeah, Akili, there's a question here. What is the most compelling criticism you've had to using OKRs and how do you address that? My, my hope in, in, in this you know, five bits was to try to address the biggest pieces of criticism, right? Like one of them is that it's too overwhelming, right? Like I've got five to 10 OKRs for my team. And what you find out in those cases is that you really need to pick a few. If this system is meant to be to focus on the most important things, what are the two to three important things or three to five? But, but how do you really limit yourself and, and focus? Um, or another piece of critique that was really valid was like the idea that they're really directional, that they can set you on the wrong path if you set up a set of OKRs that you know, are committed or aspirational in that direction. That's where we you know, came up with the, the learning, the experimental OKR, right? Asking the question of what are we trying to learn in the quarter ahead? And so we are always trying to hear and listen to what the critiques are, because you know the, the trick about this too is that you can make this system any way you want it to, right? If it doesn't feel like it's fitting within your team and organization, talk about it and say, hey, let's make this the the Blackbird way of using them, right? We're going to call them something else. We're going to use them, but you know, stick to the core principles, right? How do you describe the objective we're trying to accomplish? How do you have measurable goals and key results? And if you can do that really well and concise it's a really powerful tool, right? When you can articulate the whole direction of an organization on a sheet of paper versus like 80 PowerPoint slide deck thing, thingamabobbers, like it's a pretty powerful thing. So 
Danny, I think the only oh, one thing yeah. to share before dropping is that it yeah. is just a picture again of, of, of this piece, but you know, for folks on your team that are looking for more resources, like come to whatmatters.com. You'll find a ton of stories and educational material and so forth. But what we've got coming out, I think in two weeks is a true getting started series that will take you through what are objectives, what are key results. We'll go into some of these each point, you know, each of these points around inputs and outputs and examples and so forth. And they're broken up into little videos. And this has been our you know, desire, you know, people pick up the book and they love it. And they're like, well, tell me, tell me more. How do I apply it? Right. And so this series should be helpful with that. And so we'll make sure to, I'll make sure to send a link or post it somewhere. For yeah, please. Time. That would be awesome. I'll send everyone an email after this with some resources. Um, so just thank you so much. That was just awesome. incredible. I've learned so much. Definitely things I want to be taking into my own um, KR setting for next quarter for sure. Um, and yeah, just on behalf of Blackbird and everyone who tuned in today, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, next week, we will have one of ANZ's most loved angel investors, Rain On. He's going to take us through raising your first round. Um, and you can register via our website in the community section or check out, out our socials for updates. But yeah, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. And hopefully everyone will now implement their OKR successfully. Thanks, Thanks for this amazing me. session. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone.